Reaction being the out two seven six. That in that neighborhood, my brothers and sisters. It is Sunday once again, y'all. It is Sunday, so y'all know we about to go back to the man. Y'all know we about to go back to the milf. Y'all know we about to go back to the legend, Mister Ballin. Back to Mr. Baller once again, y'all. Hope y'all doing excellent today out there today. And I'm glad y'all came on back to the channel once again to fuck with the bean. Now, before we even get into Mr. Baller, real quick, y'all. I started recording this video, this reaction video, four minutes after Mr. Baller put this video out. Literally four minutes after he published his video to YouTube. And that bitch already got over 1,000 likes. That bitch got 1.2K likes in four minutes. That just lets you know how many people fuck with Mr. Ball and how many fans he got out here. And I'm definitely one of them. Then I looked at his, his subscribers and I'm like, damn, Mr. Ball almost had 8 million subscribers. The dude sitting at 7.79 million. It's just been great watching his fan base grow up, man. And I'm definitely going to be here. For the ride until Mr. Baller say the ride over. And I hope the ride ain't over till reaction BDO 7,895. For real. Because, hey, we're going to keep on watching them every Sunday. Mr. Baller Sunday. I digress. Check the title of the video out. Even skeptics can't explain how this man vanished. Even the skeptics can't explain it. Ain't no telling where Mr. Ball is going with this. I'm my main thing I'm wondering is it did the man ever it, has he ever been found? Or this just a total lost mystery? Is this some missing 411 type case? Cause Mr. Ball go off with the missing 411s. If y'all ain't watching none of them from him, go back a few years in his channel and check them out. But we finna check this one out. But before we check it out, my brothers and sisters, y'all know what y'all got to do. Get whatever you might need. Get what you need, Mr. Ball and Sundays. Once again, my brothers and sisters. Y'all got what y'all need, y'all ready to go? Then let's fucking go. Today's video is primarily geared towards skeptics because the story I'm going to tell you today is often cited as proof that we are not alone in this universe, that aliens exist. So, Take a listen to the story, and at the end, let me know if you agree or disagree in the comments, and I will respond to as many people as I can. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the Strange, Dark, and Mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once a week. So, if that's of interest to you, please invite the like button to come out for a fun night on the town with you, but don't show up and don't answer any of their phone calls or text messages all night. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. On the afternoon of June 6th, 1980, a 56-year-old man named Zygmunt Adamski, who just went by Ziggy, was having a late lunch with his wife and his cousin inside of Ziggy's little brick house in the English village of Tingley. That day had been a particularly stressful day for Ziggy and his family because the following day was Ziggy's goddaughter's wedding, and Ziggy was very close with his goddaughter. Ziggy and his wife couldn't have kids because of medical issues, and so his goddaughter had basically become, at least in Ziggy's mind, like his own daughter. And so in fact, at her wedding, Ziggy was going to be walking her down the aisle. And while Ziggy was really excited about this, 
he was also very stressed out that he was going to screw it up. And so he had gone over and over, you know, what responsibilities he had as part of the wedding party. And he had this little speech he had to give that he had rehearsed 50 times. He had it written out. I mean, he was ready, but he was very much in his own head about something potentially going wrong that he would be responsible for. And on top of that stress, Ziggy had gotten into a fight that day with his cousin because he felt like the cousin was being kind of disrespectful in some way to his goddaughter. And so Ziggy had stepped up and defended his goddaughter to his cousin. And so there was this undercurrent of tension at the lunch table, not to mention this overarching stress that Ziggy was under about this wedding. And so as Ziggy and his cousin and his wife have this kind of tense meal, Ziggy suddenly realizes that he forgot to get potatoes when he went to the store earlier to buy ingredients for this meal. And for some reason, Ziggy decides, you know what, I'm going to just put my stuff down now, go to the store and get those potatoes, even though at this point it was too late to make the potatoes for the meal. And so maybe Ziggy just wanted to go out and do anything to get away from his cousin for a minute and away from all this wedding planning they were doing and just kind of go out and clear his head. And so Ziggy put his napkin down on the table, he stood up, he told his cousin and wife that he was going out to get potatoes. They were like, okay, and the cousin actually said, do you want me to come with you? You know, like, is there anything else you need to get while you're out? And Ziggy said, nope, I'm good. He grabbed some cash out of his wallet and he headed out the door. The village of Tingley, where Ziggy and his wife lived, was a very safe place. He and his wife had actually moved there after fleeing from Poland during World War II, where both Ziggy and his wife, whose name was Lottie, had been held prisoner at some point. And so after all this trauma of being held prisoner and having to flee their home country, they had looked for the safest, best place to kind of resettle and stay for good, and Tingley was it, and they loved it. Ziggy had gotten a job in Tingley as a coal miner, and he had been doing that for 27 years. As for Lottie, she didn't work because she had a disease called multiple sclerosis, which meant she was confined to a wheelchair. But Ziggy and Lottie had quickly made lots of friends in town who were very supportive, and so it wasn't long before Ziggy and Lottie had a very happy and stable life in this town. The little shop where Ziggy was going to was only about three blocks away from his house, which meant walking to the store, getting potatoes, and coming back would only take a few minutes. And so Lottie and the cousin back home, they expected to see Ziggy really come back within 10, 15 minutes. But when he didn't, and after about 30 minutes went by, Lottie actually got really concerned because Ziggy was just not the type of person to do stuff unannounced. He was incredibly methodical, he was very punctual and reliable, and so being late from this little trip to the store was just so uncharacteristic that Lottie told the cousin, hey, you go to the store and see if Ziggy is there, see what's going on here. Ziggy had worked in the coal mine for nearly 30 years, and he had some serious lung issues from breathing in all of the coal, and so Lottie was thinking, you know, maybe he collapsed or something along the way from these breathing issues. But when the cousin got to the shop, the shop owner told the cousin that they had seen Ziggy. He had come in about 25 minutes earlier, he had bought a bag of potatoes, seemed totally normal, everything was fine, and he had left walking back in the direction of his home. And so the cousin thanked the shopkeeper and then left and began jogging back towards Ziggy's house, thinking, you know, maybe he had just not seen him on the way, that maybe Ziggy he was sitting down somewhere on this three block path but the cousin got all the way home and didn't see any sign of Ziggy and so after going back inside of the house the cousin and Lottie talked about what they should do and they actually went back out into the neighborhood asking around asking neighbors and other people if they had seen Ziggy but after a couple of hours of canvassing the neighborhood and not finding Ziggy or finding any indication of what happened to him Lottie ended up calling the police. But the police were not inclined to launch a huge investigation for a grown man who's only been missing for a couple of hours in his neighborhood with no sign of foul play or any other sign that anything really bad had happened. And you know what uh, this showing right here so far in this video, y'all, is how blessed we is to be in the year 2023. Because if this shit would have happened in this time that we living in now, there would have been a lot of houses in the neighborhood that got cameras that would have been able to track Ziggy all the way from when he left his house all the way to the store and back. Like nowadays, there's cameras everywhere. And I know uh, so there's a lot of people out there that don't like the fact that we record it from the time we leave our house to the time we come back in our house pretty much. But this is a perfect case of why we need this. Because if them, them cameras could have helped 
oh, let's figure out what Ziggy was from the beginning, from the jump. But let's see how this shit gonna be. And after the police began asking questions of Lottie and the neighbors about what Ziggy's life was like, they learned that recently Ziggy had been declined for an early retirement from the coal mine. Because of those breathing issues he was having, he had requested to retire now, but they said no. And so Ziggy was really upset about that. He was really stressed about this wedding of his goddaughter the next day. He had been fighting with his cousin. Also, Ziggy was basically taking care of his wife, who's in this wheelchair all the time. And so because of all these stressors in Ziggy's life, the police started to wonder if maybe it was possible that Ziggy had not been going to get potatoes, but in fact was just kind of abandoning his family. And so ultimately, on the day that Ziggy went missing, the police told Lottie and Ziggy's cousin that they should just sit tight, see if he comes back tonight, and if he doesn't, go to the wedding tomorrow because Ziggy is so close with the goddaughter. If he's having some sort of issue right now, you know, he's very likely to come back for something as significant as this wedding. And so Lottie and Ziggy's cousin stayed at the house all night. Ziggy did not come back. They didn't hear from him. And the next day they went to the wedding, but Ziggy didn't show up for that either, even though he's supposed to walk his goddaughter down the aisle. And so after coming back from this wedding, Lottie called the police, she called local hospitals, she talked to all of her neighbors. I mean, she really put out like an all points bulletin to everybody in the area that something terrible has happened to Ziggy and we need to find him. But despite police beginning to lean into this and her neighbors really going out in force to try to find Ziggy, no one could find him. He had just vanished. Mm. Thank you to BetterHelp. I don't know, y'all. This is Mr. Ball and Little Stores. Y'all fuck with BetterHelp if y'all want to, man. Fuck with Mr. Ball and commercials and shit. His advertisements. But as far as the story so far, y'all, I don't know, man. If, if I was a police in this situation trying to investigate this shit, I would be thinking, like, he had to been kidnapped. Like, this is like a kidnapping. That's what I would think. You know what I'm saying? Just the way he just disappeared and ain't nobody seen him. I would be in the mind of thinking, like, a car or a van. You know how the movies go where a van roll up and they grab the person and throw them in the van and then take off real quick. That's the mind frame I'd be in. But it's going to be way crazy than that because Mr. Ballin talking about aliens and shit. So I can't wait till you get to that part. And y'all already know how I feel about them. But y'all fuck with that. I'm going to take it back right here. And let's go. We'll listen and help. On the morning of June 11th, so five days after Ziggy went to get potatoes and then vanished, a man named Trevor Parker got to work at his father's coal yard in the English town of Todd Morton. The coal yard was basically just this big open lot that had a chain link fence around it that butted up against some railroad tracks. And inside of this lot were just these huge mounds of coal up against the perimeter of the lot. And then also inside of the coal yard was one small office building. And so on this morning, when Trevor pulled through the gates of this coal yard, first of all, he could see the entire yard the second he went in. And as he looked out, all he noticed was the fact that everything was wet from an early morning storm. And so after just kind of surveying around the lot to make sure none of the coal got blown around from the storm, he made his way to the small office building to do some paperwork. Trevor would work inside of that office building for a while, and then around lunchtime, Trevor decided to just go and get some lunch and kind of have a nice long lunch break. And so he left, he went to the pub, he was there for a couple of hours, and then around 3.45 p.m., he came back to the coal yard, and when he went through the gates, everything looked the same, except there was this dark thing on top of one of the coal piles in the back of the yard. Now, Trevor didn't know if he had seen it when he had first arrived that morning or if it was new, but whatever it was on this pile, it immediately caught Trevor's attention. And so after parking his vehicle, Trevor began walking over to this 12 foot tall coal pile with this thing on it. And when he got about 30 feet away from it, he realized he saw someone's shoe, that this dark figure was a person. And right away, Trevor started rolling his eyes because there was a group of homeless people that lived near the railroad tracks just outside of the coal yard. And it wasn't uncommon for them to get really drunk and then wander their way into the coal yard where sometimes they would fall asleep. And so Trevor's thinking, okay, clearly one of these drunk homeless people has found their way into the coal yard and they've passed out on top of this pile of coal. 
And so instead of going over and talking to this person directly, Trevor just turned around, went back inside of the office building, and he called for an ambulance. The ambulance arrived a few minutes later. They did not have their sirens on. They didn't come flying into the yard. This was a routine thing they were doing. They were scooping up a drunk and bringing them back to the hospital. And so when the medics got out of their ambulance and Trevor directed them over to the proper coal pile, they were just cracking jokes along the way. This was not a big deal. When the two medics got to the bottom of the coal pile, one of them began climbing up the coal to go see this drunk person and get them down. And so Trevor, as this is happening, he walked a little bit closer. And when he did, he realized that the person who had fallen asleep on the coal, they had really nice pants on, like tailored pants. They were certainly not what Trevor expected this person to be wearing. But before Trevor could even really react to the clothes this person had on, the medic who had climbed up had finally reached this person. They reached down and began trying to move the person around. And suddenly, when they had manipulated this person's body enough, the medic's facial expression completely changed. They went from somewhat routine to totally horrified. And they backed off of this person on the coals. They turned around and ran down the coal, practically falling over themselves. And when they got down there, Trevor heard the medic say to his partner, call the police, call the police right now. And Trevor said, what's going on? What, what did you see? And the medic who had reacted that way just shook his head and walked away to kind of compose himself. And so Trevor at this point was starting to get spooked himself. Clearly, whatever the medic had just seen had really shaken him up. And so Trevor just kind of stood there while the other medic ran in and called police. And then a few minutes later, a police car came flying into the coal yard and an officer named Alan Godfrey, along with his partner, got out of the car. And right away, the medic who had gone to the top of the pile and been freaked out by what he saw, walked over with a very ashen face and he told Alan Godfrey that something was terribly wrong with the person on top of this pile. And so Alan, not really sure what to expect, walked over with his partner to this coal pile and with the medics and Trevor standing back, Alan, on his own, climbed up the coal and he looked down at this person. And what Alan saw was a man lying on his stomach wearing a beautiful three-piece brown suit and Alan immediately noticed that there was absolutely no soot from the coal that this guy was laying on, on his suit. Even though Alan, just to get up here, had basically covered himself in black soot. And so he was wondering, how did this guy get up here and not get covered in soot? It didn't make any sense. Also, because the fucking aliens dropped them from the sky. That's what it is, man. Hey, that's what the, the damn theory be sounding crazy as fuck, but they be making sense, don't it? That's why the hell he ain't have me. He ain't dirty. I mean, you know, you know how cold is, man. Man, you, you will be black as a motherfucker. You really be having to climb through some cold. But for his goddamn body to just be like he just hopped out the shower, fresh like baby powder. That mean a spaceship after they got them doing their experiments and shit on them. They they hovered over where that cold was and they dropped them out the ship. I think I, I, I'm just talking shit for real, y'all, but this shit kind of is plausible, though. Well, let's go. So Alan noticed that this guy's hair looked totally bizarre. It looked like someone had given him like a really bad haircut with dull scissors. Like they just grabbed tufts of his hair and kind of chopped randomly. I mean, his hair was kind of all over the place. There were bald spots. And then as Alan looked from this guy's hair down, he noticed almost hidden in his hairline was this fairly deep wound in the back of his neck that was still bleeding but there was this weird green jelly-like substance very obviously placed over this wound. And Alan had no idea what the substance was. But as weird as all that was, that didn't explain why the first medic had basically completely panicked and run away. When Alan tried to roll this guy over onto his back to try to wake him up and see if he was okay, he rolled him over and Alan got a look at this guy's face and immediately Alan let go of him and kind of had to step back for a second because the guy's face was contorted in this frozen look of absolute terror. His jaw was open so wide it was almost like his lower jaw was dislocated and his teeth were baring and his eyes were bulging out of his head. And so Alan quickly realized that obviously this was not just some drunk homeless person who passed out here. 
this was a dead person, and whatever happened to them must have been unbelievably terrifying to leave someone looking like that in their death pose. It would turn out this deceased man in the coal yard was Ziggy Adamski. But this did not solve the mystery of what happened to Ziggy five days earlier. In fact, his discovery really only created more questions. This town where this coal yard was, Todd Morden, was located 25 miles away from where Ziggy lived. And as far as anyone knew, Ziggy didn't know anybody in Todd Morden. So there was no reason for him to be there. And number two, when he had left to go get potatoes, he had been on foot. So did he walk 25 miles to this random town? Also, Ew, wow. assuming he did just walk to this coal yard, this coal yard is a big, wide open lot that if you were standing anywhere near it, even outside the fence, you could look in and basically see the entire place. So it just seemed really unlikely that Ziggy could just walk into this very public open space and get to the top of one of these coal piles without somebody noticing him, whether that was Trevor or one of the other employees that were there or one of the truck drivers that were in and out of there all the time, all day doing deliveries or the homeless people who were near the railroad tracks or the people who rode the trains that passed by there every single day. I mean, there are a lot of eyes on this coal yard, but nobody saw Ziggy. It was like he just kind of appeared at the top of this pile. And again, even if Ziggy had managed to slip in and sneak to the top of this pile, why didn't he have soot from the coal all over his clothes? And if maybe he had been brought there, if someone had killed him and put him on this coal pile, there's even more reason he would have soot all over him because they would have had to drag him up to the top of the pile. And even putting all that aside, if someone really did kill Ziggy and they placed him on this pile, why? This is a very open public place. Someone is going to find him. You're going to get caught if you're the killer. And then of course there is the issue of what Ziggy was wearing. That brown three-piece suit he was wearing that had no soot on it, it wasn't his and it wasn't put on right. The buttons were not lined up. It almost looked like somebody else who didn't know how to put a suit on had tried to dress Ziggy. And then Ziggy also did not have an undershirt on. It was just the jacket over his skin. And then also Ziggy had this totally bizarre haircut that looked like someone who didn't know how to give a haircut had cut his hair with scissors and said, you know, good enough. And then of course you have this wound on the back of Ziggy's neck. Now the wound itself was determined not to be fatal. It was a fairly deep cut, but it wouldn't have killed him. However, the most significant part of that wound was that green jelly that had been placed across the back of it. During Ziggy's autopsy, they were unable to figure out what this green jelly was, and they ran dozens and dozens of tests on it. And also during the autopsy, the coroner would determine that Ziggy had actually died the same day he had been found. So he was doing something for five days between going missing and being on this coal pile, but nobody knows what it was. And as for his cause of death, the coroner was not entirely sure, but it did seem like he died of a heart attack. The coroner would search all of Ziggy's body for signs of some sort of fight he might have gotten into, some sort of defensive wound on his body, but there was nothing. However, the coroner did find there were very small burns on the back of his neck that were caused by acid, but it was unclear how those got there. When they inspected Ziggy's stomach, they determined that he had been eating and drinking regularly, and so he was not malnourished, he was not dehydrated, he was relatively healthy when he died. He just had this heart attack for unknown reasons, and apparently whatever gave him the heart attack scared him so badly, his face contorted in that horrible way. Ultimately, the coroner just kind of gave up and ruled that Ziggy had died of natural causes, and then the case was closed. But to this day, no one really has any idea how Ziggy went from going out to get groceries to winding up 25 miles away, dressed differently with this haircut, with this jelly on him and acid burns, dead with this horrible look on his face on this coal pile. It doesn't make any sense. This case has become very famous because people say it is the best example of alien abduction. 
that Ziggy had left his house to get groceries, got abducted by aliens, and then over five days, you know, these aliens did stuff to Ziggy, including cutting into his neck and dropping acid on him, and then they put that green stuff on the back of his neck, they dressed him the way they thought people dressed in the suit, but they didn't really do it right, and then they literally just dropped him on top of this coal pile, which would explain why he didn't have soot all over him. He was dead, they dropped him, and he just landed on the top of the coal pile. And even if you think that's totally far-fetched, keep in mind, still today, we do not know what that green jelly compound was on the back of his neck. It's literally never been identified, and people have been trying to figure it out for 40 plus years. Also, it's worth noting that one of the responding police officers, Alan Godfrey, claimed to have seen a UFO within weeks of finding Ziggy Adamski. <laughs> So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode, be sure to check out our podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, where we have literally hundreds more stories just like this one, many of which are only on the podcast. Again, it's called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and it's available exclusively on Amazon Music. Today's video... My brothers and sisters. Y'all already know how I rock when it comes to this. Y'all already know how I feel, man. I feel like aliens are real a thousand, a trillion, a billion percent, or at least 99.9% .9 .9%, man. I think they real, and Mr. Baller was implying in this video very hard that that's what it was, that some fucking aliens abducted this man. They were working on them, doing whatever with them, up in their spaceships or wherever the fuck they was for a couple of days. Then they thought they can drop them back down on Earth, and I don't know why. I don't know why his body was found in shock. Like he, I think he did die from a fucking heart attack or something to be dead, looking like this. I ain't even trying to be funny, but you know what I'm saying. So he had it been the last thing he had been seen the scariest shit he ever seen in his fucking life, bro. The scariest shit that me and you have ever seen. You know what I'm saying? Like this had to scare him to fucking death, bro. And when I'm when I'm saying scary shit, I'm saying past like somebody point a gun at you. Like you know, a lot of people have you know, somebody point a gun at them. Ain't no telling what the hell these aliens did to shock him literally to death. Cause I feel like he got shocked to death. And I feel like the damn aliens put the damn clothes on them, and they don't really know how humans dress or whatever. So they thought they could do something that. Look like how humans do it, but they had them looking tacky and all that shit, and they dropped them on a damn cold, and they took the fuck off, and that's why he ain't had no soot on him. He, he wasn't dirty. He was found pretty much clean. That's just my theory, man. I mean, let me see if I can play devil's advocate or try to be a skeptic. Um, I, 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 you can make the argument that somebody murdered him and put him up there, but it's just so much to fight against that. Cause like how the hell if somebody if somebody murdered uh Ziggy and put him on top of that damn uh coal mine hill or whatever, why the hell when Ziggy dirty? You know what I'm saying? That first thing. Then the second thing, can't they explain the green goo? The green goo, nobody on earth knows what it is. Like, come on man, that shit been over 40 some years ago. Like, I mean you, I don't know how you can be a skeptic. The way, that's the then that's the title of the video. Even skeptics can't explain how this man vanished. I don't know how you can even fight this other than fucking aliens. And I agree with my brothers. I'm gonna leave y'all that definitely y'all that dead, my sisters. Cause y'all know I can keep on going with this one. With these damn alien theories and all that shit, man. But they out there. I don't care what nobody say. They are out there. Go on, let y'all go down, man, for real. Let just make sure y'all hit that like button, comment, subscribe, and do all that for me. And come on back tomorrow for episode, what we on? 377? No, 277. I'm fucking tripping, y'all, for real. But before y'all go, man, I'm tripping off this damn as a baller story because I'm just tripping like these damn aliens, bro. That, that's the only thing you can point to. That's the only the explanation you can come up with. Let me be quiet, man. And before I let y'all go, my brothers and sisters, I got to say this. Love, peace, and happiness. Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.